obituary read in part, Cora Paul Bomar was an extraordinary woman. She was a consummate professional in her chosen field of education and librarianship for over 50 years. In those years, she was a force in the development of school and public libraries in both North Carolina and the nation. Few people in education have been privileged with a career as varied and comprehensive as hers was. We're very thankful to um, this memorial fund for um, giving us the uh, ability to bring uh, national voices um, here to Greensboro to talk to you about libraries. All righty. Um, my name is Erin. For those of you who don't know, I'm Erin Laramore. I'm the university archivist. I'm also the chair of the speakers, the ULLIS speaker series. So um, I want to thank Roseanne, who I, I was going to say who I saw over here somewhere. Uh, Roseanne Vizirjan, our dean, uh, for helping sponsor this event as well. I want to thank our speaker for attending. I want to welcome our lovely guests from Wake Forest and Elon who are joining us. Um, but I also want to introduce Doug to you. This is Doug Boyd. Doug is the director of the Louis V. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky. As a Duke graduate, it's very hard to say that. So we've basically been fighting about basketball and North Carolina colored pie. So <laughs> we've been arguing basketball all day. But Doug and I met in summer of 2013 at the Archives Leadership Institute, where these two ladies over here also attended. Crystal is the head of special collections, is that your title? And at Elon, and Tanya uh, zanich Belcher has the same position at Wake Forest. And uh, with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to Doug to talk about oral histories, but I also wanna remind everyone that when Doug's talk is finished, we're gonna have a reception back in Jackson Library at, um, in the space outside of Hodge's reading room. So please join us there for that afterwards. So, and I'm, I'm also gonna try and dim the lights, so if it goes completely dark, or if I break something. <laughs> I'm not checking scores of the games, but I have, a, I have to have a timer. Erin, on the other hand, will be checking <laughs> scores. Not just checking scores, she'll be watching um, games, and that's okay. How is, oh. is that better? Is that screw up the streaming thing? The stream? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. Because um, we don't want to mess with the online students. Um, they can be crabby online. Um, so, I, I did want to um, start off uh, and and say, um, you know, I wanted to, to to say that I actually did pick in my bracket, you know, <laughs> Kentucky meeting Duke, not because I think that's actually going to happen in the final, um, but because I think it feeds into this whole Donald Trump thing in terms of the campaign. It's going to stir up all this great emotion, and people are going to start yelling and screaming and. and and that's going to be good for college basketball. Um, so I come out of the, the both the archives world and the oral history world. Um, I do have a luxury, and that is uh, that for the most part, I have spent most of my time thinking and working only with oral history. Uh, so most archives, you know, have oral history collections, and they kind of, you know, they work a little bit with oral history. Um, even if they have an oral history center, a lot of the staff are doing double duty. They're working with oral history, but they're also working with very large manuscript collections as well. And so I do have that luxury of working only with oral history. So a lot of that, my perspective comes from that. But I base a lot of what I do uh, based on that sort of thinking that, you know, the tree falls in the forest and if there's no one there to make a sound, you know, does it, does it have the kind of impact? You know, it's not about the physics of sound. It's not about the, the sound waves and going 760 miles per hour. Uh, it's really about meaning, right? Uh, oral history, uh, you know, can be tied to this metaphor with the idea of interviewing, right? If we don't do the interviews, there are versions of the past that fall to the floor and they just aren't, the stories aren't ever heard. So a lot of oral history really focuses on that, going out and capturing the interview uh, and, and before it's lost, before it's, you know, because once it's lost, you can't ever get it back. You get a version, but it's not the same. Um, so interview your parents, uh, but um, if you can. But uh, the reality uh, that we have seen over the years is, you know, we send hundreds and thousands of, of, of people out into the field that do interviews, and there are archives with oral history collections that are that are filling up 
you know, with these great resources over the last 40, 50 years. Um, the reality is that the original intention of that interview, to put individual stories on the historical record, actually don't come to fruition because those interviews sit on shelves and are rarely accessed uh, in our current workflows uh, in the archive. So, so, so many of these interviews and projects still remain in obscurity. And, and so a lot of my work really focuses on not just the interviewing. I can get anybody excited about interviewing and you know, whip up support for a project, uh, but, but what's difficult and challenging is that next phase. What do we do with that interview and how do we get it used and something that gets used by classrooms and by researchers and, and, and really make that difference. And a lot of this problem comes down to the, 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 the workflow and the use model, right? The analog use model, there's a few of you in here who remember cassettes. Um, um, there's several of you who probably don't uh, remember the cassette. But the analog model was inefficient. Um, and so listening to audio in general is an inefficient process. So we archive it. The user has to come in, sit down, and listen, and maybe read a pa paper transcript. Um, highly inefficient. The result, very few people actually end up using the collections. So in 2008, when I arrived at the Nunn Center, which had been around since 1973, uh, I had 6,000 interviews in our collection. Majority were still analog. Very few were transcribed. Limited metadata. We had a few major collections described at the collection level, a few finding aids, um, but that was it. Uh, oral history is one of those things where if you don't have item level metadata, it's very difficult to use. You know, I'm doing my paper on the civil rights movement in Kentucky. Great, I have 275 hours of material for you to listen to. Good luck. Um, <laughs> and that's what the model has been, unless there is transcripts. Uh, no public interface for searching. I had a single staff member, me. Um, so my boss used to make fun of me, actually, uh, because I was the director of the Nun Center, and I was the director of me. Um, <laughs> and we used to brag that 500 researchers came in uh, each year to use our collections, um, which actually, considering uh, the limits to our uh, um, to, to our access plan, it's pretty considerable. But you know, audiovisual archivists face this, right? So it's a time-based medium. It takes time. It also takes text. So Google still indexes text, um, and we as human beings prefer text for quick use, for efficient scanning and browsing cognitively uh, uh, to interact. The problem is text is flawed. I have a thousand examples. Of, of transcripts gone wrong. Um, you know, we almost put a, you know, we've got an example of the Supreme Court uh, thing happening right now. Um, I have several, uh, several interviews with two Supreme Court justices in Kentucky or from Kentucky. Um, and uh, about to put these collections online. And they're citing landmark court cases uh, left and right, so and so versus so and so, and so and so versus so and so. And one of them, we're this close to putting this interview online in my fancy cool system that I'm going to talk about. And somebody raises their hand and says, Dr. Boyd, I think there's something wrong here. The landmark case that was being cited in the transcript was not Maryland versus Virginia, which is what was said in the, uh, said in the audio. It was Maryland versus vagina in the text. And we're this close to putting this online. <laughs> this had been corrected. This was an audited transcript, ready to go online. What happened? Was it a nefarious transcriber who puts the word vagina in every single transcript, um, uh, like the Disney animators? Or <laughs> is this, you know, it was spell check. Somebody ran a spell check and did accept all changes, and Virginia was misspelled closer to vagina than it was to Virginia. What happens when that transcript goes online? Google caches it, Google indexes it, <laughs> and it becomes part of a different historical record. <laughs> I can just see the dissertation. Um, so, you know, but there was a Facebook meme going around recently that was, you know, that said commas matter, and the example it gave was time to eat, grandma. Time to eat, comma, grandma. Two very different meanings. The mere placement of a comma in a transcript actually changes meaning. And so the problem is, and I said this earlier, that, that uh, to the group, and a few of you are going to rehear this, that the recording has always been the thing. The problem is the recording was so hard to use and so inefficient to use that the text became the preferred thing. 
Um, but the text is really just a representative representative of the recording, right? A transcript by definition is a verbatim textual representation of the recording. Uh, but uh, and it's easy to copy and paste. It's easy to search. Um, but the problem is, very few people were actually connecting to the audio when they would quote from our from our transcripts. Even people would say, "Send me your transcripts." Well, we got the audio too. Uh, don't worry about that. Ninety-five percent of our reference was focused on the transcripts. The problem was maybe ten percent of our collection is actually transcribed. So the pro, you know, there's a problem there. Um, so the other problem is with or challenge with oral history has been usability. So even I, I can, you know, I showed the picture of the woman in the in the research room. Analog was inefficient, definitely. Now digital is supposed to change all that, right? But the problem is, is these content management systems uh, have been designed for what? Photographs, manuscript collection. They all, across the board, fall short when it comes to presenting audiovisual materials. Uh, they present them like they do with manuscripts. Um, and so, in some ways, the digital model still resembles the analog model. You open up a cool PDF, right? Uh, you click on the audio and the player comes up. You can search that PDF, you know, so that, that's where the difference comes in. But then what? How do you connect it to the place in the audio? You don't. You got to find the audio. You have to guess. And in some ways, it's just like buying that cassette. You know, when we bought that cassette, our favorite song was on side two, you know, in the middle. And you wanted to go to that, and you flipped it over, and then you started rewinding, and you guessed. You use the metadata to find it, you know, and then you're guessing, and you hit play, and you listen, and you think, oh, oh no, it went too far. Back, you know, and you start rocking back and forth until you get to it. There's no difference in the digital, in the way that we're digitally delivering this material. Um, uh, and so, um, with current thinking in content management systems. So, you know, the current model has problems and or challenges, and that's why our stuff just wasn't getting used. Like, we all feel like it should be used in the oral history world. We think something's important enough to document, um, to have nobody really actually listen to it or use it um, is, is a failure. So when I came to Kentucky, I, I designed this cool system that I'll show you in a little bit. I had just been at the University of Alabama um, heading up their digital program um, after several years of being an oral history archivist and frustrated with the usability issues and thinking a lot about usability and literally drew this thing up and said we got to you know I want to do something and worked with a programmer and and put together a system that really does just that it connects uh, users to the minute and we're going to come back to that but since then um, over the last seven years now six and a half years we now have 9400 interviews so we're escalating the amount of interviews we're conducting uh, we're about a year and a half away from complete digitization uh, still have very few transcripts. We'll come back to that. We have almost complete collection series level metadata and we're increasing our item level metadata. We now have a crazy cool uh, search interface uh, for our whole collection, which I'll show you in a second, uh, where you can browse and search um, uh, all of our holdings. Uh, we now have a full-time staff of five all on hard money. Um, that includes me, so four others besides me. Um, so you're all in this academic environment and you know how hard it is to get a line. And now we have that. Um, and that is because we now have eight to 12,000 uh, uses of these collect interviews a month in the online environment. We now have, last month we had 16,700 um, page views, substantive interactions with interviews in the online. Not just clicks on a record, but substantive interactions. So we've had this massive period of growth. Well, in part, it's because interest in oral history is growing um, all over the world. Um, so China, uh, I just came back from China in December. Major interest happening there in oral history. Uh, I was in Australia in August, and they're just they're gangbusters, oral history. It's incredible what's happening down there. So um, interest on campus, more professors are getting students to, to do oral history. More disciplines are using oral history as a methodology. Partly because recorders are cheap. You can get an amazing recorder for very um, uh, cost-effective ways. And so, so we've got this model that we have transitioned over to be more of a digital model. We have actually stopped providing on-site access to our oral history collections. 
uh, because it was so inefficient and people really weren't coming to listen to 25, 30 hours of material. It's just not practical. Um, and so we've developed online protocols for really providing the majority of our reference to our 10,000 interviews or our unrestricted 10,000 interviews. So to give an example of what's happening with our, our, our center now, I tell the story of Marshall Webb. Uh, he was uh, a World War II veteran who was interviewed for our project in 1986. I didn't even know we had this interview. Um, and we got a request from Italy that came in about two years ago um, for this interview. We get those requests all the time. So this really, I mean, I literally was given a full-time reference person because we were getting so much reference for our oral history. Um, and so um, we get these requests all, all the time. Nothing, no big deal. So the guy in Italy is writing uh, a novel uh, set in the small town of Tremensuoli, uh, while um, w where a uh, major World War II engagement took place, a multi-month um, battle that took place in 1944. He's writing his novel set in, in this small town. Cool. We have a veteran, Marsha Webb, who we know actually fought in that battle because he breaks out of the interview frame and begins to recite a poem that he wrote about the Battle of Tremensuoli. That's kind of cool. You know, veterans typically don't do that in the middle of an interview, break out into a poem that they had written about this. So I thought that was kind of cool. But either way, mission accomplished. We connected the researcher to, to this kind of obscure uh, uh, reference in our oral history collection. The only reason, you know, Tremensuoli made it into the, the description of this interview was because of the poem. So we, we got lucky. Uh, so, like a good reference librarian or archivist, I actually followed up on with him and said, you know, is there anything else? Do you want me to look for any other veterans who may have fought in that particular battle? At which point I'm expecting, yes, give me everything you got, right? That's what we always hear. He just said, no. I'm not interested, thanks. And I thought, that's a red flag. So why, why, was, why is this individual interested in, in Marshall Webb? So I followed up and I said, you know, can you tell me more about the project? At which point, he uh, some minutes go by. This is the actual footage to break to 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 add the suspense. This is footage from the actual battle of Tremensuoli. So a couple minutes go by, and he sends me this picture of this alleyway. And when you zoom in, Marshall Webb carved his name on the wall during the battle. M. A. Webb, Campbellsville, Kentucky, March 44 or 1944, March 30th. So pretty cool. Suddenly. Archival access goes to the next level. You know, we are able to provide pinpoint accuracy to our collections. If we create workflows that can do that, if we can create infrastructures that can do that. A lot of people have been like, oh my gosh, what a coincidence, what a small world. No, this is incredibly good information architecture. This is incredibly good discovery system. So not only uh, are you able to to listen to or to to uh, connect from this to that in our cool interface, which I'm going to show you in a second? Uh, you're able to actually link to the moment when Marshall Webb says "Tremens Swally" or when he breaks out into his poem. So, so many people. We we released a video telling the story at one point, and so many people have gone over since telling that story. And since releasing that video on the anniversary of him signing his, his name, um, that so many people went over and did rubbings of the wall, that the city put up a plaque next to further defacing the 15th century wall. Um, but, <laughs> but they put up a plaque that had his photograph, uh, a biography, a scan of the poem that he wrote, and down there, a link to the oral history interview online. And so, so let's talk about Ohms. And let's and forgive me for the formatting there. Um, let's talk about Ohms and show you what it does um, because it's pretty cool. Essentially, what I wanted to do when I created Ohms was to connect you to the moment. So this is one of our student veterans who fought in our, uh, Afghanistan, and we interviewed him. Um, so if you search on the word Afghanistan, you know, you can search the transcript. That's great, but with a click, you actually are taken to the corresponding moment in the video. So we created a jump around experience uh, initially in 2009 that worked primar with, worked with transcripts that wasn't just giving you what the text said was said, but connecting you to the moment when you hear what was actually being said. So 
you know, the system was built primarily for us originally. I traveled around. I came down here for the Entrepreneurial Librarians Conference, and I gave a presentation about what we had done. And I went talking around the world, talking about the system at that time. And people were like, wow, that's really cool. And then you could sense. They were like, so how does it help me? Um, because there's a lot of people who have oral history and want to do something with them. And so I kind of started feeling guilty in a way that, you know, we had this great thing and, and we, we built it and we've, we've empowered ourselves to do this great thing. And so about the same time all of this is happening, I learned what happens to an endowment when the economy crashes. Um, and so I couldn't afford to transcribe anymore at my center. And so I created a system that I couldn't afford to use. I was going around talking about how great it was, but I couldn't afford to transcribe because my endowment was frozen that year. Um, so I started thinking a little bit out of the box and added to the system uh, an indexing system. So instead of a transcription, you get an index. So the index basically creates segments, story level metadata, so that you can you know, do that same search, Afghanistan, and instead of going to a word place in a transcript, you're gone, you're, you're, you're taken to segments. It's like the grocery store aisle while you're looking for the Cheerios. So same deal, you can, be, you can click and you go to the corresponding moment, but you can add a partial transcript. You can do a synopsis of what's being talked about. You can do keywords, you can do Library of Congress subject headings. You can actually upload a thesaurus of terms when you're indexing and actually work directly with Library of Congress subject headings or with any kind of local thesaurus that you've created. Any of you saw the Bourbon documentary this morning, we created an awesome Bourbon industry thesaurus. We'll probably never use it again, but it was really cool. Um, and so it'll suggest the terms as you type while you're indexing. Um, but in addition to you know, the descriptive metadata, we're adding sort of GPS coordinates in there. So when Tyler talks about where he was stationed in Afghanistan, in that moment, you can click to it. And oh yeah, he also gave about 150 interview, uh, photographs to the archive about his service. And so you're able to pull up photographs um, of this. And the cool thing about indexing that I, as an administrator, like is that I can do it for one-tenth of the cost of a transcript. So you know, last year alone, we did 900 hours of indexing of our oral history collections. Incredible enhancement to the access uh, to the collections but we did it for over one-tenth of the cost. Uh, I did it for my student budget. 900 hours of interviews went online for my core student budget. I got a great student budget, which is, a, you know, but uh, uh, essentially uh, around $16,000 to index that interview, that set of interviews for the year. Uh, had I transcribed it, it would have been a $180,000 proposition when you factored in all the costs of labor and such and all the many phases of, of transcription. So an enormous savings, but also an incredible enhancement to our collections. So um, back to the PowerPoint. So one of the things that I'm really excited about, actually, heck with the PowerPoint, let's go to the web, um, is, is also, you know, obviously I'm excited about people using our collections on a mass scale. Um, you know, the president of the University of Kentucky, Texas, <laughs> my dean um, uh, after a tour of Normandy while he's over there and says, hey, do we have any oral history interviews with, with uh, veterans from Kentucky who participated in the D-Day invasion? Dean texts me. Normally, this would have been like, you know, so high profile, scary, that I would be spending a day and a half combing through transcripts trying to find the best clips. I literally, within about 15 minutes, had three incredible excerpts that were unbelievably powerful, emailed to the dean and then on to the president, who then was able to actually listen to these moments over there while, you know, just following this tour. The president starts incorporating oral history into uh, quotes from our oral history collection into his speeches to the board of trustees and to to the general public. That's a good place to be. That's actually. Uh, impact. So more classes than ever have actually begun to use our collections in the traditional model. Hey, you've got a collection on the Vietnam War, I'm teaching a class on the Vietnam War. Can we use those interviews? Awesome, fantastic. But um, this is where it gets really cool, I think. Um, it's not just students and researchers using oral history now in the consumer model of, hey, 
you know, go listen, tell me what it's about. Um, learn from this thing that you're going to listen to. Um, I'll use the example of the Going North project. So uh, there's a class at Westchester University, goingnorth.org, Westchester University in Pennsylvania, um, that was teaching a digital history class on the Great Migration North to Philadelphia. Um, and we have a collection of about 80 interviews with African Americans uh, talking about migrating to Philadelphia from the South uh, post World War One. Incredible collection. Um, so he wanted this professor wanted these two professors wanted to teach a class based on this um, this collection. So they did have transcripts in this case. The students started off going through the transcripts. They all got a person for the semester, and they basically had to follow that person over the course of the entire semester. And they went through that person's transcript and cleaned it up, or, you know, did the did the the textual edit, the typo edits. But while they went through the transcript, I had them actually create the thesaurus. So a group of 20 students, undergraduates at Westchester, uh, started creating an incredible thesaurus documenting the African American communities in this collection uh, in Philadelphia at this period of time. And they did, they came up with about 1,200 terms, the churches, the schools, the the street corner names, the grocery stores, the, the important figures. And uh, so they worked with our archival staff to, 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 to fine tune that. We knocked it down to about 900 terms. Uh, there was a lot of redundancies. Um, and so we did help them with the quality control on the thesaurus. While we were doing that, um, they were doing primary source research. They knew the interview because they'd gone through it. So they started working with repositories like Temple University who had incredibly rich digitized collections documenting these communities. And they started picking the primary sources that they wanted. The thesaurus gets uploaded and each student actually indexes an interview. And so, so they know this person pretty well at this point. And so they go through the indexing process, which is a web process, and each student creates one of these. Um, and in, in so doing, they also were able to weave in the primary resources that they were gathering from, say, Temple. And so in this case, while Beulah Collins is talking about her life and work um, in domestic service, uh, you could click and see the locations of where she's talking about in the moment. So the students mapped this entire project or this entire community um, or series of communities and pooled newspaper articles pertaining to the interviews uh, or the content in the interviews. Incredible you know, findings with regard to, to the primary sources here. And then in the indexing, they cap off the semester by, they still had some time left over in the semester, which is remarkable. And they wrote rich biographies of each person. They created um, uh, creative works that were dealing with aspects of the collection. They did little videos featuring other primary sources and, and explaining the Great Migration North. And then they, they launched this website that is a mecca-based, a free tool, just like OMS, uh, and, and basically created an archive in the sky uh, of all these primary sources, with permission from Temple, with permission from these, these um, other repositories, including mine. An incredible way to connect the archive and the library to the classroom, I think. Um, this collaboration has won a couple of awards now. Uh, and it's really put it, you know, being put out there as a model. But what I really like about it is that when students are actually doing the indexing of an interview, there's some deep listening going on there. It's not just skim through this and get the gist of it. They have to, they're compelled to actually figure out what is this person talking about and how am I going to represent that to the world? Because they are the ones who are going to be representing that to the world. And so what we're finding is fa uh, feedback from faculty is, pretty overwhelmingly positive, that this is an incredibly uh, rich, deep experience that the students are having with this content, as opposed to just kind of cranking out a cool little exhibit. It's also something they take a lot of pride in. I got to interact with a lot of the students a couple weeks ago for the first time, uh, and, and it was pretty exciting. So um, I urge you to take a look. It's, it's called Going North. Uh, and it's a cool little thing. They're now teaching a second semester of that. So we're currently in the throes of having a second round of students um, uh, put more interviews up and work with them uh, this semester. And kind of taking things to the next level, which I think is really exciting. 
So oral history is kind of changing. This access thing is kind of changing. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, I referred to about ohms uh, that was exciting was the, the cost savings. Control vocabularies, you know, are awesome, incredible. Um, uh, you're mapping natural language to concepts, uh, so it requires this deep link or this deep thinking and and, and consideration, and and connecting oral history to context. You're creating sort of a horizontal integration of our digital collections now versus just vertical. Vertical before it's just Let's go through the newspapers. Oh, now let's go over here and we'll go through the photographs. Now let's go over here. Now we're creating a horizontal linkage between collections, which is fantastic, between repositories, which is even more fantastic. And we're able to engage communities in new ways. Uh, we're even experimenting with having community members actually do indexing of collections that represent their communities, which is a whole nother level of engagement. That's still in the experimenting phase. But, you know, we currently have 3,000 or so interviews now online. Um, and it's being used in astonishing ways. Like, yeah, I threw out the numbers, they're impressive, but it's being used now in documentaries. It's being used, obviously, in, in, in books and articles, but so many of them now. Um, people are, are continuously telling us about the work that they're doing in their dissertations and, and such, um, and, but we're getting families pop up now. Every, every week I'm getting an email from somebody who says, I can't believe you have an interview with my great-grandfather, I'm so excited. Those are my favorite actual calls to take because because it's kind of cool because those people never would have found these things otherwise. There were a miscellaneous interview buried in some collection about some topic that the family may not have associated that family member with, uh, and and but now they're finding it with the click of a couple couple clicks of the mouse, just like our guy in Italy. Uh, so we're really our audience is changing. It's now a global audience, which is which is fantastic as well. But you know, if Ohms is new to you, you all are using it here. Um, uh, in 2011, we got a grant to make it open source and free. Uh, and so it is just that, and it's now in 15 different countries uh, and being used by over 200 institutions, which is pretty cool. Um, it's getting popular because yeah, indexing saves a lot of money, that's true. But we designed it in a way that's universally compatible with any content management system. It works the same way with the Digital Library of Georgia, which is built on major infrastructure, as it is as it works with WordPress, or as it does with Omeka, or does it does in your case with Content DM. You guys have a model example of how it works in Content DM that really people from around the country are now emulating, which is really cool. So the idea of designing something that's not proprietary, that's interoperable, uh, but also something that creates more sustainability in our workflows. Oral history, I've often said, is built on a bad business model. So, you know, if we're going to mean we can't enhance access unless we can spend $600 or $400 per hour of interview or per, I'm sorry, per interview uh, for a two hour interview, um, that's fine if you got a small project. You can do anything with a grant. You can do magical things with a grant. I'm serious. You got these wizards who really can do magical things with grants. The thing they can't do is sustain the work when the grant runs out. And that's been the problem with oral history from the beginning, is that we can get all excited about doing the interviews. We can, we can do something amazing in the sky with it. But what we can't do is continue that. And so, so OMS was really a push to try and create a level of sustainability uh, and and uh, into that workflow uh, that this is more of a, a thing that we can take on for a much more affordable price tag uh, but also do it in a way that is engaging and that's going to enhance access now you know uh, I, I talk a lot about indexing um, but it does work uh, very well when you have both the transcript and the index that's kind of my favorite model um, you know is when we have that because you can really toggle between the two. So in about three weeks, it should have been out by now, but I'm behind schedule because I've been traveling. Um, in about three weeks, uh, we're gonna launch a version of OMS that's actually bilingual. So you're actually going to be able to do the same thing with the transcript and the translation, and you're gonna actually be able to index bilingually. So you'll be able to search in either language uh, and, and link to the, the corresponding moment. So that's gonna be pretty exciting. Uh, we're continually developing it, so so we made it work with SoundCloud. We made it work with uh, YouTube, uh, 
uh, in addition to some of these more esoteric services so that there is a free option. It'll work if you put your stuff up on Internet Archive um, uh, in some pretty cool ways. So, so the idea was to create something, again, that solves problems, but that doesn't paint you into a little corner, a, prop a proprietary corner. So um, that being said, I can brag about our numbers all we want, but uh, and I can talk about the tree falling in the forest, you know, in some sort of heroic way. But the reality is, oral history is a deeply personal resource that we're collecting. I've never had more takedown requests, so we're getting a lot of numbers, but people are realizing what they say is on a different historical record than maybe they were expecting. So. You know, if somebody's expecting, I'm going to put it in the archive, their perspective might be like the end of that Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? When they, they hide the Ark of the Covenant and, you know, it's the same thing. You know, in some ways, oh, I'm going to say this. It's not the case. What Google is doing uh, to the historical record now is, is something that is transformative. And we've got to figure this out. Uh, there's a real ethical um, dilemma that we're going to be facing when we're documenting such deeply personal history, important for the historical record, but also something that will be accessible on, via a search on Google within hours of us putting it online. And that raises our uh, burden, I think, and our responsibility of, uh, of taking an ethical approach and taking a hands-on approach. And so in some ways, advocating for really these, these um, sustainable, efficient workflows but at the same time, we need to be conscious of, of what we're doing because public really, really does mean public now in a very different way. So I call this informed accessioning. Um, you know, we've developed protocols for having a better sense for what we're bringing into the archive now um, because it doesn't get any more personal than what we're doing with oral history. Um, it can be the most sort of uh, um, harmless, seemingly harmless topic the bourbon industry, or it could be, you know, um, you know, basic family history, and you wouldn't believe the content that is going to actually arise sometimes from that. I'm continuously surprised at what people say on tape. So we need to remember that what we're doing um, is working with human beings here and not digital objects, uh, and, and get excited about discovery and search. We can get just excited about this, but we really do need to, to keep our eyes on the fact that, that these are human beings with families. And, and, uh, and continue to work with them uh, through this process of growing into the internet. So I'm gonna stop now um, and, and open the floor for questions about any of this. Um, I don't have a grand conclusion, um, <laughs> but uh, as I already told you the Marshall Webb story, that's cool. Um, I can tell you the story about my daughter. My daughter is 12. This will be my conclusion. She's 12 years old, she's helping me clean out the basement and she finds that cassette. And, and she wasn't 12 at the time, she's 10 at the time. And she looks at it and says, what is this? <laughs> it felt so old. There are a couple of you around here who are asking the same question. What is he talking about? Um, and I explained all this stuff to her. I was explaining about how you found something and how you listened and you know the play record thing and, and forward rewind, forward rewind. I talked to her about the mixtape. Oh. <laughs> oh. This generation is missing out. She seriously looks at it and just kind of shrugs her shoulders and says, I just want to click on it, <laughs> and puts it down. That was a moment. That's exactly what this generation wants. They want to click on it. You know, and if we design these workflows there and these, these, these discovery models that require basically an analog paradigm, they're not going to use it. And so we need to think differently about what we're doing uh, and, and, and accommodate that. So all right, so open the floor for questions. How do we handle the questions for the online people? Do you want me to repeat them? Sure. Okay. I have two questions. The first is um, thinking about sustainability. I'm curious about the community of development around the OMS and maybe sort of what is the balance of development that's done at UK versus development. Good question. By members Stay with that. Community. Hold because I'll forget the second. I forget the first question. <laughs> I'll only answer the second question. So. Um, that's a great question. So the idea is open source. The only way open source makes it is if people buy in. And the only way people buy in is if they can engage in it. And so, um, so right now, uh, we're building that community. 
primarily we're the only ones who have really developed it actively, but it's starting to happen. You all did something. Um, you didn't do. You didn't hack the code, but you did something new that everybody wants to emulate, um, and so that's had an impact. So several every other content DM shop wants to know what you all did, um, and so uh, um, Virginia Tech just actually hacked the code in a great way and offered up something that made the viewer more responsive. Um, the viewer right now is the only thing that's out there that people can work with. Ohms is a two-part system, which is how we made it universally compatible. It's only the viewer that has to hook up to your thing. You do the work in this cloud-based area, sort of a sandbox, and then you export the work and take it over to your servers where you've installed the viewer. Um, so so uh, right now we're working for the application to be actually be open sourced uh, uh, by summer. So that's going to be prim my primary focus, actually, uh, starting Monday. Um, and uh, really, I've been traveling for like seven weeks in a row. Um, but this, but this is, uh, we're really pushing for that. Uh, we've got major institutions who want to roll up their sleeves. So we're going to create an, um, uh, uh, an institutional consortium of, of, of institutions that are actually buying into OMS and want to, you know, most, most institutions are using it. They got small oral history collections, and this is enhancing access, and that's all they want. But we've got things like major institutions who, like Yale, who have major holdings, and they just want to go into it and do it, make it do more magical things. Um, and so that's going to be a great step forward, I think. So we're in the process of the institutional consortium and getting the, the primary code out for the app itself. People have done amazing things with the viewer. I, people are doing things with the viewer I wish I would thought about and didn't think about. There's a library in Idaho that just made it completely cool, way cooler than anything I've ever seen. So so I think, um, yeah, so that there, that's going to happen. I don't think it's, you know, I like the way we've done it, though, because because we have a lot of, we've built the community up. Uh, and the only way it's going to survive is that community thrives. And so the buy-in is there now. Um, it's a good time to come in and say, you guys can now take the code and do whatever you want with it. Um, before, if we had released the code instantaneously for the application, it might have been too soon because, because a lot of institutions, it takes a while. I mean, it takes a while, as you learn, to get the buy-in and say, we want to do this, can we install this, can we commit to this? That takes a lot at an institution. But then to actually do the work takes time as well. And so, so you know, that takes a little bit more. And so I like that that's happened now that we push out the code, I think that's people are more ready. I think to have uh, to take the code to the next level. It needs to be uh, way more than about me or the Nun Center. I mean, it needs to be you know about all the institutions. And there, if you go to the OMS website, you can see a lot of great examples of who's using it and how they're using it with Omeka or WordPress or or um, we're using it with Blacklight uh, in our environment. Uh, George is using it. I don't know what Georgia uses for that. You know, they, have they have a homegrown system. That's right. That's um, that um, they're constantly considering and reconsidering. Um, but they're into it big. University of Georgia is one of the biggest actual components of it because they've got the Peabody Awards archive. They've got a lot of it, a lot of video and visual uh, stuff, as well as oral history holdings like in the uh, public policy archive and such. So, so yeah. Um, next question. Okay. So my second question. I'm curious about. The um, accessibility of the viewer for maybe uh, viewers who are sight limited or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, if the ethic of oral history is to serve the history of individuals, I, I would think that another ethic of it is for it to be accessible to individuals of a wide. Yes, absolutely. Range. Now, um, right. So that's where indexing falls short. I can say all these great things about indexing and how efficient it is. But indexing is still only telling you about what's being said, not what's being said. And so from a transcription standpoint, uh, the transcript is still what is going to make that truly ADA compliant, uh, oral history in general. That's something that we're all going to have to deal with and figure out. I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to be able to transcribe all of our oral histories um, across the country um, uh, to get them online. And I'm not sure if speech recognition is good enough. Uh, I think in some ways speech recognition um, um, might actually cause some more problems in that environment than, than it solves. I don't know. Speech recognition is getting better and better all the time, but oral history has major challenges uh, um, you know, to that. I, I'm experimenting a lot with speech recognition. I've worked with a lot of the speech recognition people, the top people, um, and, and you can teach a computer 
you know, a lot of things. Uh, but when you have two people talking over each other, when you have a Harlan County accent, and when you have a crappy recording, that's basically the formula for failure for speech recognition. In studio, broadcast speech with very little vernacular, close mic does a great job. Single speaker does a great job. Um, and so that's the challenge we're all going to face, I think, as institutions to figure out how are we going to make all of our primary sources more ADA compliant. It's not just oral history. It's not just about transcription. You know, we've got a lot of print stuff that probably needs to be read. You know, a lot of people sort of say, why is the audio, you know, you know, not transcribed, but why are the newspapers not being read when we're transcribed? Why is the transcript up? And, yeah. Right. Why is the transcript up and not the audio? That's the, there is a flip side to that. And so I think we're really going to struggle with this greatly, I think, uh, over time. There's a couple of major lawsuits right now out there regarding ADA compliance and higher ed institutions. And archives are going to have to really figure out uh, what we're going to be able to do um, and what we're going to be willing to do. So I like, I never see indexing as the end of something. I see that as a step forward uh, in the access model. You know, my ideal would be to have both, to have a full transcript and in, in an index for everything. Um, uh, so that's my ideal. So paying for that is a completely different story. We brought in 624 interviews last year. If we transcribed all those, it would be about $250,000. Oral history is a long form format. Um, and so, so I'm paying really close attention to speech recognition, and I have a lot of hope in it. But right now, it's not even close to being there for oral history. It's great for finding a burger place on your phone. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, I said something to my wife recently. I used speech recognition when I'm walking to the airport. Um, and I made some reference to Stephanie. And what I was, I can't remember what I was really saying. She's like, hey, Stephanie. <laughs> that are continually bubbling up and say, we're just consistently getting requests for this, you know, and we're having to provide this kind of, you know, we'll, we'll send you links to the audio, it's not available online yet. Um, and so that's helping driving the prioritization 
process, but uh, but in terms of when things go actually into ohms at that point, that's the best way I think for us to track use right now. There are probably better ways and more, I don't know, intrusive ways to do it. But. <laughs> Well, let me explain that because the application really is for the people who, um, you know, anybody can apply for an OMS account at this point. So you just basically request it. And when you get it, I'm just going to show you, you know, let me look at the password. I guess you can see it. Um, so, so this is the OMS application. You, you apply for an account. We set you up with an account. I'll drop some samples in there. I'm going to switch over to our repository. So um, I'm the super user, so I get to see everybody. Um, but, uh, but here is the, actually, let's go to a fake one, because I could screw something up. I've done that. <laughs> I've done that. It's where my people are working on it, and I screw something up. So, so for example, uh, you know, You've got your account. The interviews that you're working on is in here. Nobody else sees them. Uh, you can, if you're the repository administrator, you can add students and anybody you want. You can assign rights to them, so they'll go in. There's a whole workflow management thing where you can track the state that your interview is in at this time. So, so here's one of the Bourbon interviews. Here's all the metadata. This is where you can assign it to a uh, to a uh, thesaurus or th assign a thesaurus to it. You begin indexing, you click on it. You do all this work here on the back end in this web account, this online account that you have. And then when it's done, you export a little XML file. That's it. So then you take that XML file to where you've installed the viewer and, and hook it up to ContentDM. And that's how the magic works there. So, so at this point, you know, the application is only for those who really want total control. You know, if all you're doing is working with a small collection, you really aren't going to need to go in and hack the OMS application or create 100 different accounts for other people. Digital Library of Georgia wants to do that because they don't want to be the, they don't want to be the master account for everybody. They want to set up accounts for all the people that they, you know, are representing and they, they all can do their own work in OMS and submit it themselves. Does that make sense? One other thing that it does that I actually find super useful having multiple students working on OMS at one time is each of the tabs you see there under metadata, index, transcribe, sync, everything, they change color based on, there's a tab at the top where when the student completes it, they can change it to ready for QC, which automatically changes the color on this main loading page, which makes my life really easy because I can quickly to be perfectly honest, if I'm going to do quality control on them, I'm going to set aside a chunk of time yeah. to do it, and yeah. so I can quickly, in a chunk of time, see which ones. So if we mark this one, if we mark this one complete here, then the Helen Weaver interview here uh, will show up, you know, as complete. So I didn't. It's thinking there might be a transcript, so I just say no transcript. Boom, and suddenly it's gone from in process to complete, and that tells people, okay, it's ready for export. We've got a big operation, that's why we developed that. I mean, we didn't have that for the longest time and it was utter chaos because we'd have 200 interviews being worked on and it was it was hard to track. So you can also export a CSV uh, version of the interview. Now the CSV kind of loses the OMS magic, but it actually better interfaces with content DM as a way to move your metadata. Uh, so so that's why we did it. It's, you know, um, and so it, it works a little bit better with content DM if you work with the CSV. You all use some of the oral history interviews in the Yes, yeah, I've got regular like 15, 20 oral history projects going on at one time. So do you have a studio? Do you have how many people videos? We have, we finally got a studio last year, um, but before that all my work was outsourced. We would take it all off site. Um, and so that was very expensive and unsustainable as well. So we finally built a, a beautiful dreamy studio uh, <laughs> where we can do both high quality audio radio style audio recording, as well as uh, video recording, pretty sophisticated video recording. And that's changed my life. And how many people are, I mean, I guess you need a videographer and an interviewer? I've got the four staff members. Only one of them is really trained up as the video, who can do video, um, but we're continually training graduate students, I think, to pick up. That's going to be the model I'm going to be able to sustain, because I am not going to be given a videographer. Um, so, 
So two people per interview, maybe the interview was eight. So say that again. How, how many people, your people are in a room? Just one. Just if, if we're doing the interview, there's two. But if somebody else is doing the interview, because like if you're a partner with us, we don't do. I don't have a, the, the big army of interviewers, so you think I do, but I don't. Um, and so we we do a lot of partnering, and on a partner project, the interviewer will come in and we'll come in and set up the camera and, and run the camera for that particular project partner. We've got about one more question. This one's for us. So I know it's a old history, but. Have has anyone used it? Yes, yes. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, we called it the oral history metadata synchronizer. That was kind of a joke name. Um, I think at one point it was the oral history metadata synchronizer 3000. Um, but then we got the grant and suddenly it became real. And um, so we prefer to just call it ohms and leave it at that. Um, uh, people are really starting to gather any time based medium. At this point, you can do. Um, if you wanted to index cat videos on YouTube, you can do it um, today. But uh, um, Duke, Duke is probably the one who's done the highest profile um, um, example of that. And they did this amazing collection of silent film that was done small towns across North Carolina, and and uh, and and they had they did something even cooler. They didn't actually use Ohms the application; they completely hacked it. And they had a CSV or an Excel spreadsheet of logging that film that a student had gone in and, and, and transferred the written logs to, to a, a spreadsheet. They actually wrote a script to translate that XML file into Ohm's index points and just made Ohm's think that we created an Ohm's XML, but it was a fake Ohm's XML file that, not fake, but it was real, but they created it in the fake way. And um, or in the magical way, and and faked out ohms and just migrated it all, in, and boom, they had that collection online very quickly and very efficiently. I think he actually is Craig Braden. He actually used mail merge to actually <laughs> to actually make it into an XML file in this awesome way. Yeah, yeah. He presented at AMIA, the Association for Moving Image Archivists, about using mail merge. <laughs> it was so awesome. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so, so that, you know, it's an amazing collection um, that they got online. And so people are starting to use it. I kind of want to use it for game film. I think it would be really cool for game film uh, to index that because that's a resource that people are really interested in. Um, uh, and so, uh, but um, field tapes. You know, sort of ethnographic field tapes, really great. You know, it's not great for short things. You know, there's no point if it's just, you know, one or two songs, I think. Um, but if it's an hour of field tapes or field recordings, that's, that's perfect. Um, and so um, as a grant, as a fellowship, uh, as a fellow uh, for Berea College, I did an experiment uh, doing 1940s folk tales that were recorded in Appalachia. And so I did sort of a folklorist indexing of that using like folk tale, tale type indexing. And it was really fun to do. Um, they haven't put that collection online yet, but they will be soon. But that was, it's definitely something that people are going to start using. It'll be great for news archives and things like that. And Duke, I think where that model is really important is you don't actually have to do it manually. If you have just titles, you really can just convert that to XML, suck it into ohms, and have it work. And, and that's you know incredibly efficient for a lot of us who have kind of the analog log, because a lot of the people were doing those kind of logs for time-based media, where fil filmmakers do it a lot and such. So, so yeah, it's going to get used more and more for that. We're starting to see those examples pop up. It's obviously being marketed as an oral history-based thing, because um, we created it, but not for long, I don't think. Well, thank you all for coming. Yep. Um, please join us back at the Rhode Jackson Library uh, in front of Hodges Reading Room for the reception. We will have the reception out in the foyer area outside of Hodges, but we also kind of where our screen and computer are, we're actually going to pull up our instances. Oh, cool. Rooms. Excellent. And so if folks want to play on the computer, I'll also open basically. When I say this, it means when I get over there, I'll pull it up. Um, I'm also going to pull up some clips that we have on YouTube that we created solely because of OMS. We were able to create 
audio short audio clips on the fly really easily because it was indexed. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these were requested for specific projects and specific classes. Um, and I'll loiter around and can answer questions about our installation. And Doug will be loitering and can answer questions. We saved tens of that, probably we saved maybe $20,000 on our last documentary um, that we did on the bourbon industry because they were indexed. Yeah. And we were writing the script based on indexed segments versus the first time around where it was just transcribed and we were just trying to you know, patch it all together. We already knew where the greatest hits were. Yep. Once it's indexed, it's fantastic. Yep. But yeah, so please come join us over there and thank you. And thank you online students.